2 John, we're going to be reading verses 7 through 13. I'd like you to follow along in your Bibles. If by chance you forgot your Bibles, the words will appear on the screen behind me. 2 John, verse 7. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you've worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I don't want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your chosen sister send their greetings. Apparently, there is something in each and every one of us where we have the ability to detect when we're being lied to or if somebody is trying to deceive us in some way. Now, I am told that that is actually a skill that can be learned and that there are some that have a greater ability in others in that particular area. But that is an important skill, especially in some positions or in some professions that people actually have. For example, that's very important if you're an airport security guard. You want to be able to detect if something's not quite right, and you're going to check that out a little bit closer. Police officers, it's important that they have that ability as well when they're stopping a car or approaching a door. They, may be, they need to be able to, to, to discern whether or not everything is on the up and up. Mothers have this skill as well. They just, it's an eight, they just can kind of tell what's going on. A few years ago, I was watching a political, de- a political debate, and during the debate, one of the com- commentators mentioned that because of this generation's exposure to so much TV, we have developed, or we think we have developed, almost built-in lie detectors. And he went on to say that makes it very difficult for any kind of televised debate, because that slight hesitation before answering the question or the smile that, that seems to us to indicate maybe anger or frustration. Or maybe it's the furrowed brow which indicates they're really not sure what they're talking about. That's interpreted as, by us as, as not being totally forthcoming of, of possibly concealing something. Now, by the way, that may or may not be true, but, but that's the way we're interpreting it. And as I thought about that, as I, as I considered that, and I think generally speaking that is true, I began to wonder, if we are so good at reading body language, at picking up these subtle little changes in a person's voice or mannerism, why then are there so many spiritual charlatans making a very good living deceiving the church today? If we apparently, as a generation, have this ability, why are some of these false teachers, false prophets, getting away with murder? Excuse me. Do we just naively uh, assume that anybody who quotes the Scriptures, anybody who uses the name of Jesus, therefore, they must be of God? See, John in 1 John, 2 John, and even in 3 John, He's writing to a church, he's he's writing to a group of people where false teaching is a real danger because there were those who were purposely setting out to sidetrack the people of God. They were, in a sense, missionaries, false missionaries trying to deceive the church of God to get them to detour, to walk down a path, to accept false teachings specifically about Jesus Christ. So in this section of his second letter, John is basically telling us two things. He's saying, first and foremost, as the church of God, make sure that you are not being deceived. See, we would be naive if we thought this would never happen to us. We know the truth. Nobody could could put one over on us. 
No, no. John says, make sure that you're not deceived. And then the second thing he says in the same passage is don't support or encourage or make it possible for these false teachers to continue on with their, with their missionary work. And so those two truths are brought out in this section of, of 2 John. And I want you to notice right off the very beginning, John gives a very straightforward test as to how to identify a deceiver, a, a false teacher. And this isn't anything new. It's the very same test that he's used in 1 John, in fact, in all of his letters. But notice what he says here in verse 7 of 2 John. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. See, it's a very simple test. It boils down to one question. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? If you and I were to have a conversation, if we were over at Tim's and, and having a coffee together, and I was to say to you, who is Jesus Christ? How you respond to that question is the beginning of, of my being, being able to understand and you being able to understand as I respond, do we really grasp, do we really understand the truth and who Jesus Christ is? And again, this, this isn't anything new. This is something that John has been teaching from the very beginning. You can turn to it if you want. Back in 1 John, we already studied this letter, but back in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, he says this. He begins with the question, who's the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist denying the Father and the Son. See, John is consistent. He's taught the very same thing from the very beginning. The reason he wrote the Gospel of John is so that you and I would know who Jesus was. And so he wants to drill that into, into our head. Who is Jesus Christ? How would you answer that? Is he the Son of God, third person of the Trinity, co-equal with God the Father and God the Son? Is he omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient? Did he live a perfect life, die on the cross, and rise from the dead? Is he the only way to have our sins forgiven and the only way to heaven? Is that who we mean when we use the name Jesus or speak of Jesus Christ? Or is it something else? Is it something different? Maybe in some cases, is it something more? Now, again, you would think, wouldn't you? After 2,000 years of the, uh, of the church being in existence, after 2,000 years of us having the Word of God, you would think that that would be a fairly easy question to answer. But today it's becoming more and more difficult to, to discern who are the real believers. I, I am amazed as I, as I go on some websites and I, and I check out some, some teachers who, who claim to be teaching the truth. But when I look at exactly what do they believe about Jesus, I go, wait a second, there's something not right here. This doesn't add up to what the Scriptures are teaching. There's one man in particular, and I'm not going to mention his name, but he's very popular, written all kinds of books. I'm sure that uh, uh, you have some, of his, some of you have some of his books on his, uh, on his shelf. I'm not going to mention N.T. Wright. But anyway, what, you look at what he believes regarding Jesus Christ. And you know what? We don't know. We honestly don't know. I looked at that. I go, what exactly is he saying? And he's really not that clear. And there are others like that as well. Some even very clear of what they believe regarding Jesus Christ. I think deceivers come in two different categories, if you would. There are those who appear to be Christian, or at least religious, and then there are those who want nothing to do with Christianity, nothing to do with the Christian faith, but they are actively opposing it in any way they can under the guise of, of wanting to be intellectually honest. And they would tell you they are sincerely seeking the truth. So let me talk just a little bit and give you some examples of, of each of these groups. Let's deal with those who uh, say they are Christians or in, in one category, at least religious. The Mormon church. 
I think the Mormon church falls into this category. And normally I don't get up here and, and name names and slam other denominations and so on. But, but this is too important for us just to, to slip by. The view, the Mormon church, the Mormon church's view of God the Father and God the Son, as I looked at it on their website, is not a biblical view at all. They believe that Jesus is the product of the union between God the Father and His wife. In other words, what they're saying here is that Jesus has not pre-existed eternally, but is now and always will be support, subordinate to God the Father. Again, that's not what the Scriptures teach. In fact, they believe that Jesus is just the first of God's children to become a God Himself. Now, the Mormons kind of have a funny view of God. They believe that there was a time when God was a human just like you and I are. And there will come a time when, when humans will actually become deity. They will become God. That, that's the Mormon belief. In fact, they have a little saying, and it goes like this. As man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may be or will become. All of that simply to say that although when you speak of, uh, to a Mormon today, they will say that they believe the same thing, you need to dig a little deeper about what it exactly is they're talking about. Because when you, when you really question them about what they mean by certain terms, you discover we don't believe the same thing. That's not what the Scriptures teach. Another example of a, uh, of a religious group are the Muslims. Now, why am I talking about Muslims as being deceivers? Well, it's not so much the Muslims, but there are those who profess faith in Jesus Christ, who claim to be Christians, who are telling us today that we all worship the same God. Have you heard that? That's a very popular uh, teaching today. Uh, we're, we're, all, we're all worshiping the same God. We're just taking different paths to Him. Now, let me say regarding the Muslims that in one sense, they do have a high view of Jesus. They do believe in the virgin birth and so on. But they don't believe He was divine. They do not believe that Jesus was crucified. Remember that. In fact, one, uh, one of the websites said, Muslims believe that Jesus was not crucified. It was the plan of Jesus' enemies to crucify him, but God saved him and raised him up to him, and the likeness of Jesus was put over another man. <clears throat> Jesus' enemies took this man and crucified him, thinking that he was Jesus. Excuse me just for a moment. In other words, what they're saying here is, just before Jesus was crucified, God switched him and put his likeness upon another individual, and that was the person that was crucified, not Jesus himself. That's the view, or at least it's a very similar view, to the heresy that John is talking about here in 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. That's basically what they say that they are believing. There's nothing new under the sun, is there? They're basically saying the very same thing. So those who say... Well, Muslims and Christians, we all worship the same God. We have different names for Him. No, no. They're trying to deceive us. That is not the way the Scriptures teach the deity of Christ at all. One more. What does the United Church of Canada believe about Jesus Christ? Here's a denomination in our country who says that they are Christians. And again, as I dug through their website, and again, it's not easy. They don't just come right out and say it. But as I dug through their website on paper, it looks like they believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, again, they don't, they don't necessarily say it as clearly as I did there, but if you dig around long enough, you'll come across that phrase every once in a while. But when you dig a little deeper, you start to wonder, what exactly do they mean by that? The telling statement for me was, and this is again from their website, it says, additionally... United Church ministers are required to be in essential agreement with the four statements of faith found in the doctrine section of the basis of union. And the four statements include, among other things, their doctrinal beliefs. And here's where my mind took me. If their, minister, if their ministers do not have to believe, but only essentially believe, in other words, they just, they kind of believe, 
Uh, they're not too sure, but they're willing to go along with it for now sort of thing. Does that mean that the members don't have to believe at all? See, again, it's very confusing. When it comes to determining what people believe, we need to be discerning prayerfully and, and honestly dealing with the Scriptures, with the Bible itself. We cannot take at face value what they say because they may use the same terms but have totally different meanings. Uh, I read one article recently, and the title of the article was this, we use the same words but have different dictionaries. That would be true in some of these situations here. Another way that some want to deceive, so these are those who, who are Christians or Christians promoting something that, that really is totally wrong, is not biblical. Another way that some want to deceive us is, because us is to cause us to question the Scriptures, to actually cause us to question the things that we have been taught, things that have been handed down to us for the last 2,000 years. And, and I don't have time to get into all of this, but I'm going to recommend an article for you that you can find on the internet. It's called Five Fake News Stories People Believe About Early Christianity. Five Fake News Stories People Believe About Early Christianity. You'll find it on the Gospel Coalition website. And when you look at this, if you've done any kind of reading, had any kind of discussions, you will find that these fake news stories, as they call them, these heresies have been repeated so often that people today actually think they're true. And there's no truth in them whatsoever. If you just dug a little bit deeper, if you, if you read a, a little bit of history, you would find that these things are not true. And so you need to go and read the article, but let me give you these, these five things that they talk about, these, the five fake stories. And I'm sure that, that most of you have heard of, of many of these, if not all of these. Number one, Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. You ever heard that? I mean, that is repeated so often. I've had people say that to me and I go, why is that still around? That has been disproved over and over again. Number two, the deity of Jesus wasn't decided until the Council of Nicaea in the fourth century. In other words, we're saying, what they're saying is the church put deity upon Jesus. He's really not God himself. Number three, Christians didn't have a Bible until the time of Constantine. All you have to do is read some of the last letters in the, in the New Testament, some of the, uh, 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 the last letters written, and you find they had a Bible. They had an Old Testament. They had some of the New Testament. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous that people would make that claim. Number four, the Gnostic Gospels like Thomas were just as popular as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Not true. Last one. The words of the New Testament were radically changed and corrupted in the earliest centuries. What they're saying is we really don't have the Word of God with us today. All of those are absolutely false. They have been disproved over and over again. All, just read that article, and it'll give you other links and so on that you can go and you can study this self, study these issues for yourself. Notice what John says in verse 9, and then we'll move on. <clears throat> He says, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. He says, there are some that are running ahead. Running ahead means to go past, to run on by. In fact, what John is saying here is they are saying things and teaching things that even the apostles of God didn't teach. That's how you know it's false. If it's not in the Word of God, then it's actually heresy. If someone is teaching new information that the Bible does not contain, they are not teaching the truth. And what John would say to us is, don't be deceived. And one of the best ways of not being deceived, notice what John says there. In fact, he says it twice. We just need to continue. Continue in the teachings of the Word of God then we know that we're not being deceived. Very quickly moving on. Not only does he say, make sure you're not deceived, but also don't support the deceivers. Don't support those who are teaching a false doctrine. Verses 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. I like the way the King James puts that last phrase, neither bid him Godspeed. 
In other words, don't say, God bless you. Then he finishes that anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. Now, quite honestly, some struggle with these verses because it appears to contradict other passages of scriptures where we are encouraged to actually give hospitality to those who are busy. And that seems to be a Christian trait, especially in the first century. That when somebody new was coming, somebody entered your community, uh, then you would welcome them into your home and so on. And this seems to go against that, but not really. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave this world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy or idolater or slander, a drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. I think you can see the distinction there. The key is those who claim to be brothers, those who claim to be in the faith, those who claim to be sisters in Christ, but they are living in such a way, they are teaching in such a way that it's contrary to the Word of God. They're actually teaching heresy that would ultimately undermine the credibility as well as the purity of the teaching of Jesus Christ. And if you provided a meal for that kind of a person, if you provided a place for them to stay, even temporarily, you're actually helping them propagate this heresy, this false teaching. And John says we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't be an encouragement to those who are teaching lies, who are deceiving, who have set out to deceive the church of Jesus Christ. See, we need to understand God takes that very seriously. Those who who want to corrupt the people of God are going to have to deal with Jesus himself. Jesus wrote in Matthew 18, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. God's not going to take that lying down. As parents, you know how protective you are of your own children. Any threat, any danger, if there's even a hint of it, you leap into action. Well, understand, God feels exactly the same way and even more so about you. That's how He feels about you. You're part of His family. And what Jesus is telling us here is you don't mess with God's family. You will answer to, for that. Well, as I said a moment ago, there really isn't anything new under the sun. From the very beginning. We have been warned that false teachers, false prophets are going to come into the church. It started 2,000 years ago. It continues even until today. Jesus said, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. Well, Jesus walked this earth. He said, here's what's happening. I'm telling you right now. I'm going to tell you now so that when it happens, you're prepared. You're aware of it. Peter says in his second epistle, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. Are we not often criticized as the church of God because of the false teaching that some on TV and these big crusades they have, some of what they're saying, all of a sudden that's applied to us. And our gospel, the true gospel, is now questioned. Don't be deceived. Don't support those who are deceiving. The best way to do that, and I will end with this very quickly, how how can we protect ourselves? Number one, know your Bible. Just know your Bible. It's as simple and as difficult as that. 
That's why that's part of our, uh, the first of our five ones. One-on-one -on -one time with God each day, just getting into the Word of God and praying and allow the Word of God to get into you. And once you know the truth, when you see the, the lie, you'll recognize it immediately. So the first thing we need to do is simply know the Scripture. Secondly, we need to remember this. This isn't, this isn't mine. This isn't original, but, it, but I think it's good. If it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's not new. Now, that, that, that one's worth writing down. It's not mine, so you should write that one down. If it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. We have the Word of God. It's been with us for thousands of years. Nobody's going to discover anything new. They may rediscover something that's in the Word of God, but there's nothing new because God has given us His Word. We need to remember that. And then very quickly, don't forsake the church. Don't forsake the church. There really is safety in numbers. There are people who will come to me on time and say, hey, I heard such and such. Is that true? And together we'll sit down and go, what does the Word of God say? And sometimes it is true. Sometimes it's not true. But if you're out there by yourself, you're vulnerable. You're susceptible to whatever anybody is saying. So know your Bible. Remember, if it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's not new. And don't forsake the church because there's safety in numbers. That's the best way we have of not being deceived. Let's bow together in prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Our God and our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word and for how practical it is and us being able to discern and being able to understand truth and, and to detect error. And Father, we pray that you would help us to become students of the word, that we may know it and so well that, that when falsehood appears, we, we recognize it for what it really is. Father, as we transition into our celebration of the Lord's Supper, we pray that likewise you'll continue to prepare our hearts and minds to receive this memorial service. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.